15 minute or less lecture series in anatomy. Chapter one, an introduction to the human body. Early in anatomy, the uh, most of what we learned about the human body came from treating wounds and injuries, uh, also from the study of animals. Many animals were butchered for food and we were able to get a detailed view of the internal workings of the animals. And also over time, the study of human corpses. People would uh, rob graves and then cut up and examine the inner workings of the human body. And this is how anatomy got its name, Anna for up, Tomi for the process of cutting, anatomy. Officially, anatomy is the study of structure and the relationships among structures of the body. While physiology is the study of function and the relationships of the various functions of the structures of the human body. Anatomy has a number of sub-disciplines that are out there. There's gross anatomy. Gross just means things you can see with the unaided eye. Although if you wear glasses, that doesn't count toward unaided. Uh, histology is the study of the tissues found in the human body. Uh, surface anatomy is understanding the surface features of the body, breaking it up into regions. Uh, often this approach is utilized by uh, family practitioners and primary care physicians during a physical. Uh, radiographic anatomy is using x-rays to look inside the body. And pathological anatomy is to understand how the anatomy changes from suffering from a specific disease or another disease. Life processes, six main processes, metabolism, that is all the chemical processes occurring in the body. Responsiveness, the ability to detect what's going on in the external or internal environment and then to respond to it. A movement, the ability to move the entire body, the ability to move parts of the body, the ability to move things inside the body, such as our blood, and even down to the ability of things inside cells to move. Growth, growth is an increase in body size. This can occur from the vision of cells. Growth can occur from increased material uh, outside of the cells, and growth can occur from the cells themselves getting bigger overall. Differentiation is important. This is how we go from being a single fertilized zygote to all the various specialized cells found in our body, from neuron cells to muscle cells to skin cells and so on. And reproduction finally is linked to growth in one way in that when our cells divide and make new cells, that's a form of reproduction, but usually it's thought in terms of creating a new organism itself. Uh, life processes usually end up going to and being linked to the maintenance of a stable internal environment, which is called homeostasis. This is especially key to responsiveness. So we have receptors that modify uh, monitor for changes inside or outside the body. Uh, that then gets processed usually in the brain to compare the value to what is ideal and if there's too much of a variance to signal effectors to respond to those changes to return us to the ideal condition. Structural organization. We are organized structurally on many different levels going from the smallest, the atom, to the molecules made up of atoms, the macromolecules made up of thousands of atoms, small organelles found inside of cells, cells coming together to form tissues, which then come together to form organs, the organ system, and then the organism. We have 11 body systems, such as the integumentary system, where the main organ is the skin, which is also a subcutaneous layer, various accessory structures like hair and nails. Uh, the integumentary system helps to protect our underlying tissues, helps in regulating our body temperature, in producing vitamin D, and in the various sensations we experience from the skin. There's the skeletal system, made up of bones, ligaments, and joints. Skeletal system is important for supporting the body, giving us a framework, protecting underlying organs. Also storage for uh, things like uh, calcium and phosphate in the bones, as well as uh, fatty tissue in the bone marrow. And it's an attachment site for muscles that then allow for movement. The muscular system, surprise, surprise, is made of skeletal muscles and the tendons that attach them to things. And very important for movement, external movement of the body primarily, maintaining our posture, 
and also producing heat that can then help with thermal regulation. So the nervous system with the brain, spinal cord, nerves, special sense organs, very important for detecting changes in the external and internal environment, interpreting, processing those changes, and responding to them, thereby overall helping to regulate many, many of our body activities. The endocrine system is a collection of various structures that all produce hormones. So we have things like the thyroid gland, the pancreas, the pituitary gland, the gonads, the adrenal glands, and so on. These hormones help to regulate body activities of a variety of types. And of course, this is all done through the production and release of hormones. Cardiovascular system houses the heart, which is a pump that then moves blood through all the blood vessels. So primarily it's transporting materials throughout the entire body. However, since many of our immune response cells are found in the bloodstream, it's also involved in protecting us from infections. Lymphatic system is a structure composed of many, many vessels linked together that can help return excess fluids to the bloodstream, as well as a number of structures that are involved in helping to protect us from the immune response, such as the spleen, thymus, the lymph nodes, and the tonsils. The respiratory system is obviously involved in allowing air to come in and out of our body. That then allows gas exchange with the bloodstream, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. Includes the larynx, trachea, bronchi, the lungs, and also allows us to produce sounds and speak. Digestive system, very many organs to this system, including the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, liver, pancreas, so on. Helps to physically and chemically break down food absorb that food now that it has been broken down small enough and then to excrete anything not used. And there's the urinary system involving the kidneys, the ureters that attach the kidneys to the urinary bladder and the urethra. It, uh, we think of it as producing, storing, and eliminating urine. But the really key functions is regulating the volume and composition of blood. Then we have the reproductive systems. The male systems, including the testes, ductus deferens, prostate gland, urethra, and penis, that are involved in producing and transporting sperm and production and release of certain hormones, especially testosterone. And the reproductive system for females, which includes ovaries, uterine tubes, uterus, vagina, clitoris. It helps to produce and transport the oocytes, to carry the fetus to term, and to produce and release the female hormones, including estrogen and progesterone. This is the anatomical position. The person is facing you, standing up, arms by the side, palms facing forward. That's the key thing, palms facing forward. There are many regions on the surface of our body that have names. You're going to have to learn all of these regions and all of their names, including cephalic or head, cervical for neck, the upper limbs, the lower limbs, the trunk. I'm not going to name all these. You can find them on figure 1.2 in your textbook. Boom, the head, many, many sub-regions for that. Boom, the trunk of the body, quite a few small regions for that. The limbs, upper limbs, and lower limbs. Again, you will need to learn this on your own. Planes and sections. With our modern technology, our ability to look into the human body, we can now view the inner body without having to cut it up. And it's pretty amazing. We can also look at the body, obviously, by cutting up. Planes are big imaginary sheets of glass that will cut through the organ or body. The frontal plane will cut through the body so that you have a front portion and a back portion. As you can see here, the brain's been cut with a frontal plane, giving us this view, this frontal section, what we can see of the brain. The sagittal planes cut the body, giving you a right side and a left side. If the plane is going through the midline, the exact middle of the body, as shown here, then it is called a mid-sagittal plane, and if it's off a bit, it's called a parasagittal plane. And here is the view of a brain that has been cut mid-sagittally. And then finally, the transverse plane will cut the body so that there's an upper portion and a lower portion. This transverse plane would therefore must be parallel to the floor. Here's a view of a transverse plane going through the brain, giving us a transverse section of that organ. Directional terms. Directional terms are useful because they allow us to talk about the relative position of two structures. Uh, 
these terms include lateral and medial. So you have the midline going down through the body, giving us the right and left side. The midline for these terms is important. So lateral means further away from the midline, while medial means closer to the midline. So here we have the radius and the ulna. The ulna is medial to the radius, is closer to the midline. The gallbladder, on the other hand, compared to the ulna, the ulna would be lateral from the gallbladder. Also, we can talk about anterior and posterior. Anterior more toward the front of the body, posterior more toward the back. So here we have the heart and the spinal cord. The heart is anterior to the spinal cord. We also have superior and inferior. Superior closer to the head, inferior closer towards the feet. So here we have the urinary bladder and the esophagus. The urinary bladder is inferior to the esophagus. For one limb, if you're talking about the structures in one limb and one limb only, you will use the terms proximal and distal instead of superior and inferior. Proximal means closer to where the limb attaches to the trunk. Distal means further away from where the limb attaches to the trunk. So the radius is distal compared to the humerus, while the radius is proximal from the phalanges. Again, one limb only, replacing superior and inferior. Superficial and deep, usually when we're talking about layers of a structure or with things surrounding other things. So here are the heart, the skin that surrounds it. The heart is deep to the skin. The heart is further away from the surface. The skin is superficial to the heart. The skin is closer to the surface. Body cavities, we have the cranial cavity, where we have the brain and meninges, the vertebral canal, the spinal cord and meninges. Uh, we have some other cavities in the head, orbital cavities for the eyes, nasal cavities, oral, oral cavity, where we have the tongue, the teeth, and so forth. We have the thoracic cavity, where you can see lungs, heart, uh, part of the trachea. We have the diaphragm, a muscle that is thin sheet-like and separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. Abdominal pelvic cavity can be broken down into the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. Uh, it turns out that you can break down the thoracic cavity even smaller. We have a right and left pleural cavity that houses one lung and only one lung, the pericardial cavity for only the heart itself, and the mediastinum, which is everything between the lungs that includes the heart. The pleural cavities and pericardial cavities are formed by serous membranes. Serous membrane is a two-layer structure with a little bit of fluid within it. So if you manage the fist as an organ, there has one layer lying on the organ, that's the visceral layer, another layer on the, away from the organ, that's the parietal layer, with a little bit of fluid in between. And the serous membranes will help to reduce friction and provide lubrication. Uh, there's also the peritoneum, another serous membrane found in the abdominal cavity. This also reduces friction and also holds structures in place. There are many organs that are intraperitoneal, meaning they're mostly surrounded by the peritoneum, and other organs that are retroperitoneal, which means they might touch the peritoneum, but they are not surrounded by it. Uh, we can break down the abdominal pelvic region into nine regions called abdominal pelvic regions. So we have a two lines parallel and two lines that also are parallel going in the uh, perpendicular to them. And this gives us nine regions, the right hypochondriac region, the epigastric region, the left hypochondriac region, the right lumbar region, the umbilical region, the left lumbar region, the right inguinal region, the cubic region, and the left inguinal region. We can also break the abdominal pelvic region into four quadrants by doing uh, two perpendicular lines running through the uh, belly button. This gives us right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. Radio imaging, Radiogra radiography uses x-rays. You can do it two-dimensionally. It's normally what we see. You can also use it for very sensitive things, mammograms that look for cancer in breast tissue. You can also add contrast substances to allow us to see soft structures that no, don't normally show up. Uh, we can do computed tomography, allowing us to get an impressive view inside of the body, needing computers and x-ray shot from many angles. There's also magnetic, res magnetic resonancing image, which will let us look inside the body using magnetic fields. We have sonography using ultrasound scanning, endoscopy using light, and it is all amazing, so learn about it quickly.